Good afternoon and welcome to the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization Governing Board. This fine February 8th, 2018. Next, we'll let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the, the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, item number three is public comment. Anybody is welcome to sign up. Just let us know. Uh, turn it in to uh, Lisa, and we'll get you on the agenda. Item number four is the Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC Citizens Advisory Committee, and the CAC report. Mr. Bob Calm. Thank you. Uh, the Technical and Citizens Advisory Committees met on Monday, and uh, they submit to you uh, recommendations that are on the handout at your place. Uh, the TAC and <coughs> excuse me, THC and CAC recommend. The TPO uh, adopt resolution 18-13, uh, adopting safety performance measures and targets. Uh, also, the recommendation is to approve resolution 18-14, uh, approving the transportation improvement program amendment. And finally, the uh, body has recommended approval of the new uh, updated strategic plan with an additional uh, caveat or additional uh, proposal. Uh, the uh, motion uh, is to approve the strategic plan and also to develop and incorporate a three to five year set of goals into the strategic plan. The strategic plan, was pointed out, is, is uh, an 18 month document that's very operationally focused and the uh, bodies recommend that we develop and incorporate into the plan a little bit longer range set of goals uh, the, uh, for, for uh, strategic planning purposes. And we can discuss this further uh, when we get to that item on the agenda. All right, thank you, Mr. Calm. Any questions for Mr. Calm? <coughs> Seeing none, this is, I just need a motion to acknowledge the receipt of the draft TAC-CAC me meeting minutes of December 11, 2017. So All right, I have a motion for approval by Mr. Ollander, second by Mr. Santiago. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. 4B is Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Advisory Committee, the PB. The BPTAC report, Sarah. Good afternoon, guys. I'm Sarah Crom. I'm the multimodal program specialist for the Space Coast TPO. Um, the BPAC met on January 22nd, and they we had kind of a mini orientation, like essentially the orientation that Bob presented to you guys during, I believe it was last April. We condensed it down to be more BPAC focused, and we presented that to them. They also um, they approved a set of 2018 goals that the committee wishes to accomplish during that time period. They are found in your agenda package. They, through that set of goals, they formed a community event committee. So the BPAC committee is wanting to get out more into the bike pet community and um, hopefully promote some safety or you know provide support for some, some bike ped trails activities. They, the Brevard Bicycle Coalition presented to them as well as also the Malabar PD&E presentation that you guys will see this afternoon. I wanted to share some um, upcoming events and information. So as you may know, the um, East Central Florida Regional Rail Trail is finally nearing completion after 20 years of hard work from multiple agencies um, and, and different staff members and such. So you guys should have received invitations already to those events. And I wanted to um, share a video that the city of Titusville made, kind of doing a promo for February 20. So February 23rd is going to be a VIP ribbon cutting. And then on the 24th, it's going to be a community event. So actually get people out on the trail and start using 12.8 miles of brand new trail. This is the largest installation of trail that Brevard County um, has had so far. So I wanted to share the video. Oh, I did this last time too. How do I get it to work? <laughs> Lisa's doing it for me. <laughs> okay, now I'll click on.
but we hope that you will come support um, the trail system because this isn't just a big win for the city of Titusville and Brevard County um, as far as adding this recreation to it. It's a big one for transportation in Brevard County and our regional trail system to have such a large project that um, is nearing completion and will be opening. So we hope you can come out and support, support us on one of those days. You can even volunteer on the 24th if you want to or um, they're having um, like VIP riders so you get a special colored t-shirt if you know you want to be a VIP on that day. So um, I also wanted to share a couple other things with you is um, the B4 Summit Bikes Bus Beach Brevard um, Transit Summit occurred on um, just last month. I know a couple of um, the committee me or the board members here were able to attend and um, I wanted to share some pictures that we had that day. Mm. So we have Jim, wow. um, Alan Woolwick, one of our um, um, BPAC members. So basically they, um, during the summit, they opened up the new bike share out in Cape Canaveral as well as also um, every person was able to get fitted with a bicycle helmet. So they're nice and safe. We have mm. Madam Ooh, Chairman. There I go. <laughs> Chair <there. laughs> Some more of our BPAC members. I had my helmet on. <laughs> There's <Lossie>. uh, <laughs> Mr. Randall. <laughs> and of course our staff Steve. member Steve. So thanks for everyone coming out and supporting our transit system and our new bike share and just this continued interconnectivity and intermodal system that we're building here in Brevard. And that's all I have to report today. Any thank questions? you, Ms. Crom. Any questions for Ms. Crom? Seeing none, thank you for an awesome job. Thank you. All right, item 4A and B, reports from the cons uh, committee. Oh, excuse me, four, I'm sorry, five. Five consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Bob Com. There, there are two items on consent agenda. Well, first is the uh, minutes from our last meeting in December. Uh, second, our committee appointments. There's one committee appointment in the package who's also received one since the okay. agenda was published. Uh, it's at your place. Uh, the appointment is to the Technical Advisory Committee from Space Coast Area Transit. It is appointing Scott Nelson uh, it, to replace uh, Jim Liesenfeld as the committee member. All right. Thank you, Mr. Calm. Um, so I need a motion. I'd like to pull item A for correction. Okay. Mr. Forrester said that he was not in the minutes, but he was at the meeting. We will revise the minutes to uh, reflect that. I just want to uh, remind all the members that uh, we take the attendees from the sign-in sheets. And if uh, for some reason you didn't sign the sign-in sheets, we won't have you logged as, as attending. That was the sign-in sheets. I thought I had. Huh? Well, perhaps okay. we'll, you know, yeah. we make mistakes on that, so, no yeah. All right. Just wanted to fix it. All right. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Forrester. So, uh, board, what is your pleasure? Item 5, A and B. I need a motion. motion. With the, uh, as corrected. As corrected. Who, who said? Okay. So I have a motion for approval by Mr. Forrester, second by Mr. Holton. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item 6A, TPO Secretary. Uh, in December, we had elections of officers and appointees to various uh, other bodies. Okay. Uh, Stuart Glass was appointed or elected, excuse me, as secretary. Uh, since that time, the South Beaches Coalition has appointed Steve Osmer, who is here today, as their representative and relegated uh, Mr. Glass to uh, the, the alternate position. So Mr. Glass was uh, elected as secretary, and since he is not a full-time member but an alternate, we need to elect someone else to serve as secretary. Uh, the secretary position also serves on the executive committee, but other than that, it's not a demanding position. So okay. no one should be a, yes. no one should be uh, afraid of it. So you won't, get, you won't get writer's cramp. <laughs> All right, so I need nominations. If, if the chair uh, would consider a motion, I'd like to move to approve the requested action of uh, putting Steve Osmer as the representative for the secretary. Well, if, I'm, if I may, Commissioner, this is Mr. Osmer's first meeting. 
And I thought that may, we talked about, we thought about well, that. Yeah, since it is I saw the to, wink of the eye. He wants it. <laughs> yeah. It, All it, right. It, hey, being, <laughs> I'm not opposed to it, but I just want to point that out. This is his first meeting, and, and to uh, elect him as, as an officer of the organization, if he's willing to do that, that's, that's fine. But he must know that being this is his first meeting, he's buying drinks for everybody. <laughs> Afterwards? <laughs> that's part of the program. I'm not opposed to that part. Um, I, I would prefer not to take on secretary at, at this time. Obviously, mm. it's my first okay. time being here. All right. Decline that. So do we Sorry, have another? Rocky. It All really right. was something in his eye then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Okay. Any other nominations? Now the executive committee uh, consists of Trey Holton, Betty Moore, and Andrea Young. So we need somebody other than those individuals and myself. So we need Mr. San Diego. It's easy. What, what was this? <laughs> it's, sec it's, it's secretary. And you'll be on the executive committee, too. When, when, is the, when, is the, when are the meetings? As needed on the executive committee. It's, it's just as needed. So. Okay. I'll take the, 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 the primary function of the executive committee to date has been to conduct the director's annual performance evaluation. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 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 All right. That's fine. I'll take so it. Usually the meeting is either directly before or after a TPO meeting to make it convenient. All right. To make it official, I'll make a motion. Okay. For Harry Santiago to be the secretary. I'll yeah. second. So if it's a nomination, I don't need a second. Right. So we'll go ahead and close the nominations and then vote on Harry Santiago. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye and the motion passes. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 6B, approval of resolution 18-13, uh, the SCTPO safety performance measures and targets. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Bostel. I'm the transportation analyst with the TPO. Um, I see some new faces around the table, um, but I did give an introduction to uh, the required federal safety performance measures um, in December, um, but I'll go over that uh, real quickly, too. Um, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with some of the federal transportation acts that we've had in the past, uh, and um, performance measures were first uh, introduced in the, the MAP-21 uh, Transportation Act. And at that time, there were a lot of high-profile um, transportation facilities that were crumbling, br bridge collapses, and things of that nature. So as part of this Transportation Act, um, they wanted to get all of the states across the nation to start tracking performance measurements because they all had different ways of doing it. Some didn't do it at all. And, but Florida has been really far ahead of the curve and has already been tracking many of um, the measures and um, targets that they're requiring across the nation. So this is kind of just to get us all in the same uh, playing field. Um, but again, Florida is already way ahead of the curve in tracking things. They've already been tracking safety data. And we as a TPO have a high emphasis on safety. We uh, report safety in our state of the system report. And we've done some county, uh, countywide safety study to see where some of the hot spots are and to see how we could address some of those issues. Um, so um, there are several performance measures that have to be adopted as part of these federal requirements. Um, safety is the one that we have to adopt today. And as I mentioned, we do a lot of work with safety already. And so this is almost a formality, if you will, just to make sure we meet federal guidelines and to make sure we're in compliance with everything. And so we have two options for um, setting targets. That's another part of what we have to do. And we can either support FDOT's safety targets or adopt our own. And if we choose to support DOT's targets, DOT collects all of the necessary data that's required federally. They track it and they submit the data and do all the reporting to the Federal Highway. And, and we work towards one common goal with DOT and we appear united to the public. 
And so if we set our own targets, FDOT will still collect the data, but us, we as TPO staff will have to analyze the data and we're responsible for submitting the data. And different targets could be confusing to the out to public looking in. Why does DOT have one safety target? Why does the TPO have another? And one major thing to point out here is that um, there's no funding associated with this currently. Um, so if we don't meet DOT's target, we're not in jeopardy of losing any funds. Or um, if we do, we're not getting more. So it's, again, to reiterate, they're just trying to get the whole nation to start focusing on tracking the performance of the transportation facilities. Um, and so here's a breakdown. Um, it's also in your agenda package, uh, more formally, of what the DOT performance measures are. Um, they have to report on the number of fatalities, serious injuries, um, fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, uh, rate of serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, and the uh, number of non-motorized serious injuries. And uh, at a really small table, you can see that um, this is an example of some of the data DOT is producing. And so they're already very capable of, they're already collecting this data and very capable of uh, reporting to Federal Highway. And so the DOT safety target is actually zero. Um, they see their target is zero. They want to see uh, work towards the goal of no fatalities. Um, they see don't see any acceptable number of fatalities to enter into this program, um, and we'd all like to work towards that goal. And so, if you um, see in, in some of the handouts in the package that they actually couldn't enter zero into the federal form that they had to submit, so it's point one. So that's the lowest possible number that they could enter. And so we, as staff, recommend um, to support the FDOT uh, target for 2018. We do have the option each year to revisit this issue and, if necessary, to set our own target in the future. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bastille. Any questions? All right. Very good. You did a great job. Thank you. All right, so what is your pleasure to approve resolution 18-13? If the chair would desire a motion, I would move yes. for approval of this. Uh, our little community of Cape Canaveral is already a member of the zero accidents and zero fatalities. So uh, it's a okay. good, worthwhile deed, and the presentation he made with DOT setting the goals and doing a lot of the work really makes sense, Steve. And I have a second. All right, so I have a motion. All right, so I have a motion for acceptance of uh, approval of resolution 18-13 by Mr. Randall, second by Mr. Allender. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. <laughs> Item 6C is approval of the resolution of 18-14, fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 22, the transportation improvement program, which we refer to as the TIP amendment. Yes. So, Ms. Georgiana. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has requested uh, a TIP amendment uh, to our currently adopted fiscal year 18 through 22. Uh, transportation Improvement Program. And for the new members, the TIP is what we like to refer to it. We always use acronyms uh, in, our, in our area. It's basically a snapshot of the DOT work program. So it is just a, a, a reflection of the five-year work program, and we have to keep those two documents as consistent as possible. Um, that amendment is on page 37 of your agenda package, and it is for uh, Country Club Road School Safety Project. It's to fill in sidewalk gaps, uh, basically a, a grid network uh, around the school area. And um, also on page 38, there's a slight change in the funding. This project was funded with uh, TPO funding. Uh, but due to a cost update where the department goes in and updates the cost uh, occasionally, they have added $45,000 of DOT federal funding to go along with the project. So it's really a minor change uh, and a housekeeping item. So we are asking for approval of Resolution 18-14, amending our fiscal year 18 through 22 Transportation Improvement Program, and we do need that via roll call vote as well. 
All right. Thank you, Georgiana. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, I need a motion. So All right. So I have a motion for approval of resolution 18-14 by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Osmer. Discussion? Seeing none, we're going to use a roll call vote. Yes. Blanco? Yes. Forrester? Yes. Colton? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Osmer? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Randall? For the motion. Santiago? Yes. Smith? Yes. Young? Yes. Did I miss anyone? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. There <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's okay. Thanks. All right, so the motion uh, is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Item 6D, approval of the 2018-2019 strategic plan by Laura Carter. Page 39. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, before I begin with the 2018-19 strategic plan, I wanted to take a couple of moments and present to you the results of our 2017 strategic plan and the accomplishments that you helped us make throughout the year. So if you'll bear with me with that. Um, the TPO, as you know, operates on the direction of a strategic plan, which identifies the TPO's mission, vision, and our goals. Strategies and objectives have been developed to ensure that we are meeting those goals. We also use the strategic plan as a performance measure as part of the TPO staff's annual evaluations. So as you can recall, in your agenda package monthly, we have a strategic plan report. It includes four goals, which include plan, implement, communicate, and lead. I'm going to highlight some of the accomplishments under each of the four goals. The first goal is to plan, improve regional planning and decision making. In July of last year, the TPO adopted its annual transportation improvement program that included over $720 million programmed on various projects. We are also heavily involved with regional coordination and planning projects. We've attended over 20 such meetings throughout the year, such as our quarterly MPOAC and alliance meetings, and regional project studies, such as the Central Florida Expressway Authority's State Road 408 Extension PD&E. Our coordination and support with our modal agencies included having Space Florida present their master plan to the TPO and its committees last May. The Canaveral Port Authority has been working on their master plan, which they recently approved, and will be presented within the next couple of months. We continued in 2017 to support the Space Coast Area Transit. TPO staff members were project advisory team members for both the regional transit study and for the update to the transit development plan this past year. A new initiative in 2017 was to explore and learn about sea level rise and coastal resiliency. A high level assessment has been performed and conducted by the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council and the results are going to be presented later on today's agenda. Our second objective under the plan goal is to monitor and report transportation system performance. We are required to have a congestion management system, or CMS, that establishes a process or program to plan and address congestion. This requirement is included within our annual State of the System report. Our State of the System report has expanded over the years, and we are looking more, more than just congestion. We include demographic trends, and we evaluate our transportation system through a quarter approach. In 2017, the evaluation on the 2016 network included over 218 corridors, and we were monitoring just congestion, ITS, intelligent transportation network, transit, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, and safety trends. We also collect traffic volumes on over 500 segments throughout the county, with a total of 600 in our database. We don't necessarily collect the same segments every year, which is the reason the discrepancy between 500 this year and 600 total. In 2017, we piloted a new data collection of bicycle and pedestrian counts. We did this as part of our quarter study on Aurora Road, and we also just collected them on Sorna Road as that quarter study is just underway. We conducted our biannual student travel survey that asked students how they get to and from school. 
The preliminary results, as this was just done in December, indicate that about 60% of the students are getting to and from school by personal vehicles, 27% are using the buses, and the remaining are walking, riding, or biking to school with carpools. Moving on to our third objective under the plan goal is to target transportation facilities for improvements. This is where all of our corridor and feasibility studies are being recorded and tracked. On the left hand side of your slide there, these are studies that the TPO staff has managed. They included the Wickham Road operational analysis, which was presented this past December, the Aurora Road corridor study, which we anticipate bringing the results to you in May, and we are finishing up later this year the ADA bus stop analysis, and we have just initiated the Sarna Road corridor study. Along with managing studies, staff also supports and participates in the DOT planning studies. This past year, the second phase of their quarter phase uh, plans, the concept development phase, was began, begun on a Galley Boulevard, which is a study from the Indian River to State Road A1A, 406 from I-95 to US-1 in Titusville, and also US-1 in Titusville along the one-way pairs. The DOT has also completed the State Road 524 quarter study, which is moving into the PD&E phase. Our second goal is to implement enhance our transportation system performance. So all the plans under the first goal are now moving into an implementation phase. The big success this year, I feel, in 2017 was a final completion and opening of the second phase of the St. John's Heritage Parkway. And this was from the Palm Bay city limits just north of Emerson Drive to US 192. We also saw the construction phases for two interchanges, which is extremely unusual to get even one interchange built in a year. They began on the St. John's Heritage Parkway, the southern interchange, which is just north of Micker Road. And we have the new diverging diamond interchange going in at Vera Boulevard right outside our doors here. Advancing our priority projects for the PD&E phases included the almost completed Malabar Road PD&E, which we will be hearing later today on the agenda. We also are in the PD&E phases for Babcock Street from Mitko to Malabar and working with the NASA Causeway Bridge Replacement PD&E through FDOT. In the design phase, we have the State Road 528 widening, which is including a trail. And we also have design funded for two intersections along State Road A1A, the first one at State Road 520 in Cocoa Beach, and the other one is funded at North Atlantic in Cape Canaveral. Babcock Street from Malabar to Palm Bay Road is also fully funded and for right away. Also not included on your slide, I wanted to bring out and point attention to, if you drive in Southern Brevard, US 192 and Mitten and Wickham, they're going to be having an intersection improvement project there that was a result of the quarter study we conducted and completed a few years ago on US 192. We also have a second intersection at US 192 in Hollywood and Evans that is under design right now and moving along successfully. In the area of trails, Sarah has been very busy this year. As mentioned, the East Central Florida Regional Trail Trail is nearing completion with ribbon cuttings later this month. Also, the second phase of the Brevard Zoo Linear Trail is now under construction. The second phase will extend the trail south under the Pineda Causeway, which was built with a tunnel to accommodate the trail and is going to end near Turtle Mound Road. The Coast to Coast Trail sections are also moving forward. Design on the east side of the Brewer Causeway is almost complete, and the design from Indian River Avenue to the bridge is underway. Construction for both of these sections is funded in fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 22, respectively. The Space Coast Trail section, east of these two sections on the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, is under PD&E, and the design phase has been programmed in fiscal year 22. We also saw the ribbon cutting for two complete street projects. Construction was completed on both Florida Avenue and Cocoa and on Minuteman Causeway and Cocoa Beach. As you recall, in prior years, we had Peachtree Street and um, so I think there might have been another one, can't recall. And we also have Hickory Street in Melbourne, which will be under construction shortly, and Hopkins Avenue in Titusville will soon finish up its design phase. The last area under implement goal that I want to highlight is our efforts under the Transportation Systems Management and Operations, which we refer to as TISMO. It is an area that is not necessarily visible by anyone, but it has a significant impact on your daily lives and commutes. The City of Melbourne received funding for design and construction for three of its Intelligent Transportation Systems projects. 
These projects will help coordinate our signals that result in increased reliability of the system. The TPO also assisted with conducting an analysis for the design scope of a new traffic management center. We were then successful in getting funding for the design phase for the new Traffic Management Center, or TMC. It is scheduled to be located off of Pineda Causeway between Wickham and US-1, next to the Holy Trinity High School. The wall on the bottom right corner of the slide there, the pictures, is in the Traffic Engineering Office and now has expanded to two cubicles. It is needed at the TNC is TMC is needed because this room is now maxed out and in order for us to continue to monitor the success of our ITS system, we will need to be moving to a new location in the next few years. Our third strategic plan goal is to communicate, foster community enrichment, empowerment, and engagement. With the addition of our new public involvement officer this year, Ms. Smith and Ms. Hemingway have continued to expand our outreach. Over 1,800 participants were reached through educational safety programs and events. Walk to School Day had 45 schools participate, and Bike to School Day had 23 schools. Over 1,500 helmets have been distributed, and staff has all conducted, also conducted eight helmet fittings throughout the year. Ms. Smith also spent a few weeks of her time each September reaching out to our youngest audiences, pre k I think they're around four or five years old, teaching them about pedestrian safety through the Head Start Outreach Program. Over 6,000 participants have been reached through staff attending various events, including our bicycle rides, senior days, and walk-wise events. We initiated a specific outreach program last year and met with 14 law enforcement agencies. We made those contacts to increase our bike ped safety alerts and promote various safety programs and messages. The agencies now know that we are a resource that they can tap into. We also connected with 17 libraries, letting them know who we are and what we do. Ms. Smith also considered her active involvement with the FDOT program, Alert Today, Alive Tomorrow. One of their main events they use to get the word out about pedestrian safety is at the Daytona 500, which I believe they will be at again this year in a couple of weeks. Some of the tools used to reach the public have seen increases this year with Ms. Hemingway's Hemingway boosting our presence on social media and our website. 10 e-newsletters were sent with 18 press releases. The TPO has mentioned that we found at least 78 news articles over the year covering many different projects. We increased our reach on both Facebook and Twitter and our website continues to provide a wealth of information on our programs and how to get involved with them. In 2017, we added a monthly participation report included in your agenda packages. Also, through our TPO managed quarter studies, Wickham and Aurora Roads, we were able to track and get feedback on what method of notification works best to notify the public of our upcoming meetings. We found that the best method is the most expensive one still, and that's through direct mailers. Our last goal of strategic plan is to lead. Ensure the agency is financially stable, soundly managed, and staffed by competent, engaged professionals. We maintained and managed 40 contracts that range from interlocal agreements to work orders to our copier contract. We conducted a request for proposals process for new general planning consultants this past year and awarded contracts to four firms. On the financial side, we had our fifth consecutive year of a clean audit and our fiscal year 17 operating budget and grant budgets totaling over four million combined were maintained without any issues. And you, our board members, were very busy this past year approving various items and listening to us up here and our guest. The TPO board has approved 42 items, agenda items, and you listened to 14 presentations throughout 2017. Congratulations. Mr. Kahn also presented a full orientation in April to our committee and our board that gave a great overview of who we are and what we do. We also continued our annual tradition of our BPAC awards given out each May that recognizes those in the community who, who promote and support our bike ped projects and programs. Lastly, we do all this by continuing to keep up to date with the latest rules and regulations and initiatives. TPO staff attended 34 training events last year, and we held an annual workshop with staff to develop a new plan that I'll present next that continues to move us forward. Best of all, staff is pleased and excited that our new executive director is going to be Ms. Georgiana Gillette. We hope that the 
presentation I just gave you represents many of the accomplishments that you've helped us achieve. And we are look forward to another year with you guys. All right. Is Thank you, Ms. Questions? Carter. Any questions for Ms. Carter? A lot of great information. A lot of it. I want to acknowledge the outstanding work that the TPO staff does to accomplish all of those activities in the space of a year. You don't really sometimes realize how much is getting done until you stop at something like mm -hmm. this and, and have a retrospect on uh, everything that's been done. So I, I, I just think it's great. You're great people to work with and uh, just outstanding, outstanding work. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Calm. Mm -hmm. So I need a motion uh, to. Not yet. No. I haven't gone over the new one. Oh. That was just what we did last year. Now oh, I'm going to tell you right. what we're going to do over the next year. That's right. But that's okay. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, I'm going to present the draft 2018 19 plan. We've made some significant changes from the type of plan you're used to seeing in your package, so I want to highlight what those changes have been. We revamped it and updated the plan to reflect the ongoing trend to conduct performance based planning and monitoring. The plan has been reorganized to reflect our top six goals that we are responsible for, and the plan now has targets set to monitor our progress in meeting each goal. To better fit our operations from both the planning and financial sides, we have realigned the plan from running from a calendar year to our fiscal year. So this first year of the plan, you will see that is for a year and a half, and that's to get us to a July-June time frame. This will then match up with our unified planning work program, which is where we gather and coordinate our strategic planning activities. It's also aligned with our desire to conduct employee evaluations in the July-August time frame so that any proposed salary increases align with our operating budget, which is from October to September, multiple years there. With the new plan, we are also able wanting to report on a quarterly basis instead of monthly. So the six goals, Remember, I just went over the four we had previously, plan, implement, coordinate, and lead. We've expanded them to six. And the goals are, first, manage, which was previously under lead. These activities under this goal relate to how the agency is administered. B, monitor, which was previously under plan, includes collecting and analyzing data, system performance, and mobility trends. Prioritize, goal C, which was previously under plan, is what the main purpose of the TPO is, is to prioritize and rank our projects that maximize our funding resources. The fourth goal plan, we will plan a safe, efficient, multimodal system. Implement, goal E, all projects pulled from various plans will be collaborated with partners to implement the transportation improvement that's been identified. And lastly, we have engage, which we previously called communicate, which will involve the community stakeholders in the transportation system. So for the first uh, goal, I'm just going to highlight, I'm not going to go all over all of these. Um, you do have a handout at your place that's a little bit bigger, which is the summary of all of our goals, so you can follow along with that. Um, there are eight performance measures under this goal, each with its own target. For example, we're going to be developing and adopting a new fiscal year 19 through fiscal year 20 unified planning work program this May. Once we adopt the new plan, this target is going to be met. We also need to execute a new executive director contract, which needs to be done by August 31st. The plan also notes that we have 32 agenda packages listed as a target. This includes the TPO, the TAC, CAC, and the BPAC. And remember, this is a year and a half plan. So it has all of those meetings included. This is one target, however, that we might not meet if we have the unfortunate occurrence of another hurricane canceling a meeting. Second goal, monitor. As of today's agenda, you just uh, approved the requirement of performance measures as required by the FAST Act. We have four more to do this year, and we anticipate adopting the remaining areas by this November. We will also continue to annually collect our traffic counts and publish them by June of each year. Our third goal, prioritize, are annual accomplishments. Depending on the legislative schedule, schedule and election cycles, the adoption of our non-CIS project priorities will sometimes be in July like it was last year, but this year we do have until September. And this is also where we adopt our annual transportation improvement program. The fourth goal of the strategic plan is to plan. Under this goal, we have seven performance measures. The development of the long-range transportation plan is a multi-year process, so this measure is going to be updated as we progress through its development. 
For this year, our measure is to get a scope of services approved in July. The 2045 LRTP must be adopted by October of 2020. We also plan on updating our bicycle pedestrian mobility plan, and a scope of services is anticipated to be presented to you in April for approval. For implement, there are six performance measures. The targets for these are all numerical and requires us to track the meetings and projects we are involved with. We do anticipate starting two new corridor studies that the TPO staff will manage. These are the Banana River Drive, Pine Tree Drive, and Indian Harbor Beach later this year. And next spring, we anticipate beginning a quarter study on Minton Road in West Melbourne. The target of 30 for attending project-specific meetings includes our coordination work with FDOT and locals regarding their projects. These include corridor studies, pd es design, and construction phases of various projects. Finally, we have Engage. We have established a target of conducting at least 20 school-based education programs, which includes our bicycle rodeos, pedestrian education, and annual Head Start programs. For community-based programs, these will consist of outreach efforts giving presentations to various agencies and interested groups. The Alert Today, Alive Tomorrow, and WalkWise campaigns are examples. So as I mentioned, at your place, you do have an 11, 11 by 17 size plan that you can review. And I wanted to point out that we'll be presenting this quarterly on a status basis of what's been achieved. We will update the plan and, for example, if a performance has a target of, say, 25, and we've conducted five of those items, the report's going to reflect that. We will indicate that progress is being made with a blue arrow, and that if we feel that we are behind the target or feel that we're a little bit off in the timing, we will indicate a brown arrow. Once a target has been reached, we'll put a green check box next to it. And, but if a target's met early and it's a numerical one, we will continue to update it with our actual number of meetings attended, even if the target has been met. So today's requested action is to approve the 2018-19 strategic plan. All right, thank you, Ms. Carter. Any questions for Ms. Carter? Uh, Mr. Randalls. Yes, if I may. Uh, I'd like to direct uh, to the director here. We were at the uh, West Palm Beach meeting, and this was brought up, and he, uh, your director, ours too, got recognized for the outstanding work on this program. And, uh, but I just have a question to him, and thank you for staff for making this little <laughs> picture this. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you seem to know some of eyes getting old, but my real point in, in this bringing this up, and I analyze it like everybody did, I guess, but are we going to be so busy planning, organizing, recording, and reviewing that we're going to stop doing? I mean, this is a lot of extra work. It's not extra in the fact that we already do it now. That's part of our daily jobs and part of our weekly time We get an email reminder sheets. from Laura uh, at the time that we're putting the agenda together. Yes. Uh, so please update your strategic plan so everybody gets on to a common shared uh, drive on, on our computer system and just updates it. So, no, it's not any, any uh, additional labor or impediment at all, wow. Rocky. Well. And I like it from a manager's point mm -hmm. of view because, as you saw in the previous presentation on what we yeah. did in 2017, there's a lot of balls in the air. So this kind of periodic formal reporting on what's been accomplished by staff along a very structured program really helps in managing your organization. Well, that speaks well for you, Natalie, but, but uh, it, it just is a, a lot of recording. And there's steps all along the way in this, and I like it. But mm -hmm. it's, it looks cumbersome. Yeah. It is a different that, that's format. Because we don't do it. It looks cumbersome. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it works. They do it every day, so it's just routine for them to be doing it. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, All Jerry. Right. That's exactly say, right. Know, it's routine. That it becomes case, routine. Based yes. on what they've, you said, right. it's, it's just routine. Is that it works. There's no question, yes. but it works because you were recognized for it. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Is that it, Mr. Randalls? That's it? Well, that's it, unless you want a motion to approve the I have Mr. Holton who wants to say a few words, and then, yeah, we can do a motion. Mr. Holton, did you? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on one of the slides here, I, I want to I make note that the change in the adoption of non-strategic intermodal SIS project priorities, it appears that we're changing that 
uh, from July to September 2018. Is that correct? That was because of the legislative schedule. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, this is just a, a kind of a comment here, but I think it's of uh, regional significance, and that is that uh, the real estate market's moving pretty fast right now. We don't know how much longer that's going to last. There's a lot of positive growth that's happening in Brevard County and throughout the state. Um, in the city of Palm Bay, we're growing uh, exponentially. Um, I, I want to make a note that uh, project, uh, regionally significant project number 14, which is a newly uh, added project, is the parkway uh, from Babcock uh, going westbound up to St. Andre and then ultimately connecting to the west end of the parkway out where Heritage High School is. That was a newly added regionally significant program um, adjustment. In our comprehensive plan in the city of Palm Bay, we require a PD&E as part of our transportation element. We did that primarily because we don't want to do things like approve preliminary PUDs in neighborhoods, potentially right in the alignment of where a road would go. And that may be things that you might want to go back and look at your comprehensive plan and, and make sure that you're doing uh, things as you're supposed to. Unfortunately, our council just approved a preliminary PUD inconsistent with our comprehensive plan. Uh, we need to get that PD&E uh, programmed. Right now, like I said, it's on the regionally significant list, but it is, it's not programmed. The city of Palm Bay, for example, is interested in uh, paying for or contributing towards that PD&E study uh, so we can be consistent with our comprehensive plan and have good growth. Um, so I, with the change in the date, and I understand why, because of the uh, legislative time schedule as well, I just want you uh, uh, to know you may be hearing from the City of Palm Bay about that particular project in the future. Okay. All right. May I? Yeah, Mr. Calm. Yes, I'd, I'd like to comment on the, uh, the TACCAC recommendation that we, in conjunction with the strategic plan, we develop a, a set of goals on a three to five year time frame for various, uh, primarily I think modal, uh, well, uh, like bicycle pedestrian goals, uh, uh, transit goals, sustainability goals, whatever else we may, may come up with. Uh, I th I, 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 frankly, I don't see any problem with that. But uh, we have not had a chance, even at staff level, to discuss that, to really figure out what specifically it would be and whether it has performance measures or not, exactly how we go about developing them, getting them approved, how we track them. So that, I think the goal, as we understand it from, from the discussion on Monday, is worthwhile. Uh, we have a very operationally oriented plan that, that deals with the, like the here and now, at least over the next 18 months. We don't have something that's looking out further. And generally, when you look out further, it gets a little f uh, less precise and more difficult to track, but it's still worthy of looking out and establishing some direction in, in, in the out years. So I just wanted to respond that uh, our intention at staff after a quick discussion with staff is that we need to talk about it internally to see what this means. Uh, you're right about work effort. We do not want to be so bogged down with our own uh, processes that we get in the way of getting things done. I don't, I don't want to have that clearly. So uh, I'm looking at our staff because they were wondering what I was going to say about this. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back in a couple of months after we've had a chance to work through this and, and put a little structure to it and bring it back for your consideration uh, here, here shortly. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Calm. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, uh, what is your pleasure? Mr. Randalls. Well, if, if you're to me, I would move for approval okay. of this plan. Of the 2018-2019 yes. strategic plan. Thank you. Second. All right. I have a motion for approval of the 2018-2019 strategic plan by Mr. Randall, second by Mr. Halton. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. We are now into reports and presentations. Item 7A is going to be presented by Tara McHugh. 
The uh, sea level rise vulnerability assessment. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today to provide a brief overview of recent resiliency and sea level rise modeling efforts in Brevard County and the transportation and the transportation vulnerability assessment parameters, findings, and recommendations that we conducted for the TPO. Throughout Brevard County, there are a lot of different efforts being taken towards resilience, but what exactly is resiliency? Through a regional resiliency action plan effort that the Regional Planning Council is conducting with various stakeholders in Brevard and Volusia counties, the steering committee has adopt, adapted a definition from the 100 Resilient Communities Program. We have defined resiliency for the action plan as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within the region to plan, sustain, adapt, recover, improve, and grow collectively, regardless of what kind of stressors, chronic stressors, and acute shocks they experience through specific actions, implementation strategies geared towards specific vulnerabilities. With that said, in 2016, the regional planning councils throughout the state brought to local communities and agencies around the region and across all the various RPC regions, training focus, focused on available modeling tools from NOAA and UFGO plan that can be used to assess vulnerabilities to sea level rise and flooding. Last year, NOAA, the American Planning Association, the National Association of Counties, the National Floodplain Managers Association, and HUD conducted a workshop in Brevard to focus on community resiliency and improving community resiliency through planning and modeling. They are also providing a follow-up report to the county sometime in the near future. The City of Satellite Beach has also continued to look at stormwater infrastructure impacts and solutions, as well as policy development and continual stakeholder engagement through grant activities with various partners to continue to be a sustainable and resilient community. Lastly, UFGO Plan updated their sea level scenario sketch planning tool last year, so they hosted another workshop in Brevard County to update the improvements to their plan. These past training opportunities have always focused on tools and activities that transportation, natural resource, growth management, and emergency preparedness teams and planners could use in creating resilient communities. <clears throat> because efforts, policy changes, and strategies can't be developed and implemented in silos, so we try to make sure everyone's at the table. It takes all of these partners and even health and economic development sectors to come together to create a resilient community. So how does that play into the TPO and your local governments? New federal and state legislation is requiring or advocating for local governments and transportation organizations to address flooding and sea level rise impacts and vulnerabilities on infrastructure and develop strategies to reduce these vulnerabilities. The Florida legislature adopted the Florida Community Planning Act in 2011, which provided the opportunity for local governments to determine areas that may be designated as adaptation action areas. This is a voluntary designation that different communities can undertake. The, these areas are to help focus adaptation measures to critical facilities and improve their resiliency. The parallel flood requirements from Senate Bill 1094 in 2015 now includes sea level rise as one of the causes of flood risks that must be addressed in the redevelopment principles, strategies, and engineering solutions to reduce flood risk in coastal communities. Coastal elements must contain a coastal redevelopment component that addresses how to eliminate inappropriate and unsafe development in coastal areas when opportunities arrive. Finally, the FAST Act of 2015 expands the focus of resiliency to the transportation systems and require the MPOs and TPOs to develop strategies to reduce vulnerability on existing transportation structures. It's important to look at your transportation infrastructure because increased flooding and inundation of these facilities can lead to the loss of right-of-way, roadway capacity, impact evacuation routes and degrade infrastructure and utilities because they weren't built to withstand long periods of inundation. Access to various facilities such as flooring areas, evacuation shelters can also be compromised during flood events even if the facility itself is not impacted. Stormwater storage systems will begin to be compromised as water rises and impact the ability of these systems to discharge into various waterways. Solutions to these problems take thought time and planning. Opportunities need to be seized early on to implement short and long-term solutions and strategies at appropriate junctures in order to make the biggest bang for your buck. 
The project began in July of 2017 with the objectives to complete a preliminary assessment of transportation vulnerabilities to sea level rise, discuss the potential of compromised stormwater drainage, and provide recommendations for addressing resiliency at the TPO. We use the UFGO Plan Center sea level scenario sketch planning tool since this is a transportation focused model that was developed in conjunction with FDOT. We also have used this platform on a variety of other assessments conducted for the um, River to Sea TPO, Satellite Beach, and other local communities. This is where it gets difficult. <laughs> Um, there are various sea level rise projection rate curves available as shown in this slide. The blue line is the NOAA and U.S. Army Corps low scenario, which basically is a his the historic trends and doesn't take any changes to climate into account. The green is the NOAA intermediate low and the U.S. Army Corps intermediate rate, followed by the brown, which is the NOAA intermediate high curve. This curve is important because the FEMA community rating system in 2017 has chosen to require at a minimum communities use this curve for projecting to 2100 in order to get credit in their CRS plans for looking at future conditions. The red line is the U.S. Army Corps high and the purple is the NOAA high. We focused on the Army Corps projections, which are consistent with the NOAA, except for the red line. Because of other work completed across the region, we wanted to make sure that we were consistent with those efforts for the preliminary analysis. Also, the U.S. Army Corps provides a step above the CRS minimum, and it's not as aggressive as um, the NOAA high. Climate data and rate curves continue to be assessed with new information all the time. In fact, NOAA's 2017 curves came out last year. So um, some of the tools are now looking at the 2017 instead of the 2012 curves. The region will need to continue the conversation as to a unified approach um, for looking at sea level rise, but agencies should really look at a range of impacts and curves, not just one, depending upon the type of the facility, the type of facility they are assessing, the, its operational lifespan, and its allowable risk. Based upon this data, Brevard and the Army Corps rate curves, Brevard sea level rise rises may reach up to 1.2 feet by 2040, 2.85 by 2070, and over 5 feet by 2100. <clears throat> this rise in sea level then leads to inundation of the land or flooding of the land. With these sea level trends, just as we just discussed, <clears throat> inundation levels may reach up to 30 inches by 2040, 49 inches by 2070, and 77 by 2100 during high tides. The next few slides are visual depictions of the modeling that we completed and where this inundation is likely to occur based upon curve and year. It's kind of hard to see on this, I'm sorry. The darker areas are 2040, or what we would consider the most vulnerable. Um, and as the time horizon increases, the color gets lighter. This is the low rate curve for Brevard, for Northern Brevard. And these are the Army Corps curves again. This is the intermediate. And this is the high. It's interesting to look at the high curve because that's where you start to get impacts on the western side of the county. And again, this is low for Southern intermediate and the high rate curve. In the report, we also discussed tidal flooding, or what we call recurrent or nuisance flooding. These are the annual occurrences that we generally, generally see in October, which exceed local thresholds for minor flooding impacts to infrastructure. <clears throat> this past year, we noticed ours in October with Hurricane Irma making conditions much worse. Um, the picture on the left was Coco. As sea levels rise, these flood events are anticipated to increase in frequency and duration. According to this data from NOAA, our annual king tides will increase to 156 flood events over 13 days with a 1.6 foot rise in sea level. And with a 3.2 foot rise in sea level, these events will increase to 657 events over 123 days in one year. In a sense, today's flood will become tomorrow's high tide as sea levels rise. As part of the assessment, we looked at evacuation routes and found that Merritt Island Causeway is potentially vulnerable and may see impacts by 2070. A1A, US-1, and 520 are also extremely susceptible to sea level rise.
it needs to be taken into consideration that this analysis was just sea level rise inundation only and does not account for things such as a 100-year storm or um, storm surge or other types of flooding. Causeways, especially um, 528 and 520, are ex expected to experience significant inundation during high tide. Pineda and Augali are also expected to experience inundation as well. These causeways need to be more closely examined to assess other environmental in other environmental factors such as increased erosion from higher storm surge and potential increased nuisance flooding resulting from higher sea level rises as these can impact the integrity of these causeways. Outside of evacuation routes, we also looked at the major roadway networks. Most of the impacts occurred under the high rate curve by 2100, with many of the, many of the vulnerabilities occurring in Merritt Island and the Barrier Islands. US-1 and A-1A and A-1A, oh, A1A have intermittent <laughs> sections vulnerable to sea level rise throughout the county. And um, these are our top, our most impacted roadways. State Road 3, 520, A1A Beach, Road, North Banana River Drive, Newfound <coughs> Newfoundland Harbor, South Patrick Drive, Tropical Drive, and Courtney Parkway. We also assess impacts to the Florida East Coast Railway and the Federal Rail Line, so these, um, the, the feds as well as the private company of the rail line will have to look at these assessments further. We also analyze impacts to the trail system, both existing and planned trails. While most impacts occur in the Merritt Island area, there are multiple smaller sections throughout the county that may be vulnerable to sea level rise. We also assess various facilities that are vital for evacuation and recovery purposes. While many facilities throughout the county are not vulnerable because they are placed in very good locations, the facilities shown here are expected to be impacted by sea level rise. Again, as I stated earlier, a closer assessment of all the facilities should be conducted to determine access issues, although the facility itself may not be impacted, and vulnerabilities to other hazards such as surge. Finally, we conducted a preliminary analysis on other important facilities for the, for the county, such as Port Canaveral. Again, the darker areas being inundated by 2040, and then 2100 are the lighter areas. Patrick Air Force Station. Patrick Air Force Base. And Kennedy Space Center. There's more information in the report concerning these, these facilities. Recommendations are also provided in the report. The recommendations shown here are just a summary of some of, the, some of those that were provided. It's important for the, the TPO to review and incorporate strategies and processes into internal plans, programs, and policies for addressing sea level rise and flooding to ensure consistency throughout their programs. It's important also to work with stakeholders to determine a standardized approach for assessing impacts. Additional assessment of causeways, spans, and run-ups will also be important, as well as priority assets may need to be um, discussed with local comprehensive planning, and as you had mentioned before, making sure that your comprehensive plans and all the other plans across the region are addressing this issue collaboratively. Cost-benefit analysis for flood migration mitigation should also be addressed in different projects and green infrastructure techniques could, should be considered for helping to alleviate flooding especially when improvements to roadways such as complete streets are occurring throughout the region. Public engagement is also a huge part of resiliency and this TPO does public engagement and outreach in a tremendous manner so good job on that and now they have something else to talk about. <laughs> so. um, my phone number is wrong. It is 242-0300, so if you want to give me a call, um, that's the correct number. Thank you, Rocky, for oh, pointing that out. Okay. 242. It's 242. 242. Okay. I don't know why, it's 245. But. Oh, okay, 245. All right. Thank you. Any yeah. questions for Ms. McHugh? Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So, obviously, there was a lot of info built into mm -hmm. the report and a lot of recommendations that were um, put out to the report. So we kind of sat down internally and wanted to have a discussion prior to presenting this to you um, so that we could kind of start forming in, internally what we could see as some next steps um, or more immediate steps. Because obviously, as Tara said, this is a long-term problem. You know, solutions aren't going to happen overnight and some solutions 
we might not need to mess with until you know later on in the planning process. Um, so as far as what we were thinking is we we're going to continue our planning efforts. We we're going to incorporate um, this information into our long range transportation plan as well as also our state of the system report that we issue every year. Um, we were while evaluating project priorities we were going to see you know if any of those priorities do fall into these vulnerable areas so then that discussion during implementation can be be had. We also wanted to reach out to um, the maintaining agencies of those critical sites that Tara had brought up with you know the Patrick Air Force Base and the port which actually the port already reached out to me um, and they're already working on some stuff um, and um, we also are currently participating in the Regional Resiliency Action Plan and this is really exciting because it's another project that Tara's working on and essentially it's going to create an action plan for both Volusia and Brevard County because obviously transportation facilities cross county lines, you know, we're not in a little isolated box as well as also clearly um, resiliency and sea level rise and such is going to affect the entire coast, not just Brevard County. So this regional resiliency action plan is essentially going to um, provide a plan for both Brevard and Volusia County and the municipalities within to start working towards building more resilient communities, not only for sea level rise, but also other natural and man-made disasters. Um, so it'll just help build stronger communities. There are going to be several opportunities for people to, uh, stakeholders to help feed into that plan, specifically in May, what is it, May 8th? off the top of my head. Um, we're going to have workshops at the um, health department, so hop and a skip away from here. Um, as well as also in August there's going to be some work, um, public meetings as well. So we're really interested to see what comes out of that resiliency plan and we, we as the TBO staff hope to work towards whatever actions come out of there. Um, as far as localized efforts, is there's you know stuff that us as, as the TPO staff can do, but also there's things that the municipalities could be doing right now, working on their comprehensive plans, um, considering incorporating adaptation action areas, or um, possibly creating sustainability or resiliency committees. And actually tonight at five o'clock, um, the city of Satellite is hosting a, a, our first Brevard Sustainability Summit, and I wanted to call out the um, cities that are going to be participating tonight at that summit, and that's Cocoa, Cocoa Beach, Indy Atlantic, Melbourne, Melbourne Beach, Palm Bay, and Satellite Beach. So kudos to those cities for taking the next step and forming these committees to start working on, on these problems. So that's right. the staff perspective. Right. Thank you, Ms. Crom. Any questions for Ms. Crom? Question. Yeah, Ms. Lopez. Because of this sea level rise that we're going to anticipate, Will the equation of how the funding is distributed, will it be increased for our eastern area? I have not heard of any linkage between identifying vulnerable locations for sea level or Brazil, needing resiliency treatment. There, there is no separate money for this. This has to be worked in with everything else. It's yeah. a shame. I mean, well, considering this is what we're going to face, that the equation of funding will not consider that. It's really a shame. Well, we're going to consider it as part of our evaluation of, of project priorities. If there's a project come up that, that uh, uh, is one of the identified vulnerable locations, we will flag that out. And if there is an improvement uh, a program, then I think it, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the design takes into account what sea level conditions may be in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think over time we can be instrumental in implementing uh, consideration of this, but there's no, not going to be separate funding for it. Uh, at this time. No. Yeah, at this time. Mr. Holton. At this time. <laughs> yeah, at true. this time. And Mr. Holton. Thank you, Chair. And, and I understand the question from Councilwoman Lopez. Um, I think it, the issue may be a political issue more than anything else. and. So I would just encourage as we move forward this year with the gubernatorial elections uh, that we communicate to uh, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent, uh, that you discuss with them about the, the appropriations. And, and I believe that they will respond. If you look, for example, to Lake Okeechobee, that became a statewide political issue. And so uh, there was um, legislative action both by the legislature and or executive action by the governor's office that I think helps so I I think that's that may be where the solution is 
Well, and this is not yeah. limited to Brevard County. No. Or, yeah. uh, you no. know, so this is a state. This is going to become a statewide issue eventually. Mm -hmm. It already is in South Florida. Miami Beach has already had to take some remedial, remedial actions to uh, mm -hmm. preserve some yeah. some areas down there. So it it is coming. Yeah. Mr. Forrester, are are we taking this into consideration as we make plans for any work that we're doing on the causeways, for example, to uh, increase elevation to increase their resistance to uh, sea level rise, which would also increase their resistance to flooding during hurricanes and so forth. Uh, you know, the, the, the TPL is a planning agency, not an implementing agency. So we have some limitations on what we can do. The, the, however, that being said, we have heard, I have heard for years and years about concerns over the elevation of State Road 520. And the desire uh, among particularly Cocoa Beach folks that I've talked to about the possibility of raising the elevation. Well, the first question I ask is, okay, how high do you want to raise it? On what basis do you pick a number? How you know what? What's the science behind uh, the water out there to determine how how high it should be raised? And and I assume I just say that uh, not to be snippy about it, but the point is that it's one thing between saying let's raise it and another uh, thing to get into the point where you're designing an improvement where you really need specific information. The 520 Causeway in particular. Uh, is loaded with other stuff. It's more than a road. Sewer lines, water lines, telecommunications, fiber optic, electrical transmission, uh, what else is out there? Uh, everything you can think of, all those utilities are in that causeway. And if there is damage, erosion, and any of those facilities are damaged as part of a storm event, uh, that affects the ability to, to uh, to rec for recovery. If you don't have your, if those big concrete power poles come down and bring all the electrical lines with it, do we have the equipment to get them out of the way to open up the road again? I don't know. Uh, uh, the port, what would the, be the economic impact if the port were out of commission for many months due to uh, uh, damage? Uh, same with our major employers at the Space Center, the Air Force Station and Patrick. Those are all coastal facilities and vulnerable. Now, those facilities and the port are aware of this and are working on it. And we propose to at least find out what they're doing and, if possible, uh, become partner to them. If the port is doing some things within the port area, uh, can can the improvements or the reaction or the action stop at the port boundary? Or does it something need to continue on uh, to make whatever the port is doing effective? Well, that's what we need to know so that we can help coordinate it to a larger area. So uh, there's a lot of questions about what to become of it, but I think the first thing, and this was the first step, is being aware. Can I? You know, is being aware is that, yes, there may be debate about the rate at which things are happening or the cause for different things, and that, that's, that's fine, but I think it's, it, it's coming. It's coming, and we as public servants should be in a position to be aware of it and do what we can uh, so that we don't get into approving uh, actions that just are going to, uh, that cannot be undone later on. Can I add to the causeway conversation, Bob? Excuse yes. me? Do you mind if I add to the causeway? No, I don't think so. so no. um, in regards view. to, you know, the causeway's vulnerability, is that this was a very high level initial snapshot basically where we could see what areas are vulnerable. Is in order for us to begin pursuing, you know, encouraging someone to implement something on the causeways, it would, we would have mm -hmm. to have something more in depth, a more in depth study or plan put into action, which there's been a vulnerability assessment on our causeways, but that only looked at storm, storm surge for a category three hurricane. Yeah. It didn't incorporate the sea level rise um, concept. Oh, I'm saying, I, I know that it's hard based on this to, to plot out 2100. Mm -hmm. 2040, 
I mean, it, it takes 10 or 20 years to do anything from conception of a project to complete it anyway. <coughs> and so if we're going to have a project that impacts one of these areas, it seems to me that it would save us money in the long run if we looked at that and, and worked with the local governments and the county government to say, okay, you're planning this, but we think that in 20 years, sea level is going to be this much higher. Can you raise your road bed? Can you Can increase you the board? elevation of your access ramps? Can you, you know, whatever. And then that seems to me where this group would come in is, well, I, is in the long-term planning for that so that, so that you don't go out and spend $20 million fixing a, a section of road right now and then have to go back in 10 years and spend 20 more. You know, well, I, I think it's important that it be recognized as an appropriate reason for spending more money on a transportation project. Uh, if it's uh, fifty million dollars to raise the cost to 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 uh, how am I saying this? Uh, it, it will increase the cost of a project to elevate the roadway. And the natural reaction today would be, well, we're not going to spend that. Because that is not considered a justifiable, you know, uh, 2,100 sea levels is not considered a sufficient justification at this point in time, at least with the state DOT, to justify that additional expenditure. So until it becomes widely known that this is a priority and a, and a legitimate justification for expenditure of money, uh, mm -hmm. I think we're going to be fighting it every time we bring it up. Mm -hmm. We've and, already and faced not, it on 520. And I'm not talking about directly spending money. I'm talking about if we have a project that we're already mm -hmm. looking at, yes. mm -hmm. can we not affect the design of that so that we don't have to go back and redo it in 10 years? Yes, I, I fully understand up. what you mean. Um, which, for example, I actually, mm -hmm. State Road 528 is you know currently under um, design. design, and I did send the consultant the pages of this report. Um, you know, showing that five, the 528 causeways were vulnerable. And that's the so. kind of thing I'm talking about because yes. I'd rather spend yes. an extra five or ten million dollars now than have to spend fifty or sixty million dollars. Well, there, and there's from. another element to take your, your your point. If you look at the map of vulnerable roadways down in your area in the South Beach area, south of Pineda, A1A is not coming up with a red line on it. Well, no, I, I'm not. Yeah, you're saying I'm you're rocked. on a ridge. No, 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 I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm thinking of the fact that it, 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 it affects my neighbors sorry. all over the county. But what, what we do see on the mapping is the vulnerability of South Patrick Drive and right. the East West Roads. It's, the riverside is the issue in the South Beaches area, right. not the ocean frontage, right. which I think is kind of contrary to what people would expect. So, you know, if, it helps us direct where more attention should be paid. Well, and it might not affect your community directly, but it may affect your citizens as far as them getting to their jobs, as if they work out at the port yes. or, you know, they work out at KSC. Is, um, during our first stakeholder meeting, um, one of the representatives from KSC said to me, he's like, we could build 10-foot walls and keep the sea level completely out of our area and never be affected. However, we're not going to have the employees to come and run our, run our show. So that's just another perspective. And so. If I can add one thing. Uh, it's interesting. We can build 10-foot walls to hold the water back. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been looking in South Florida, and they've discovered that that won't work. That won't work. <laughs> and the reason that it won't work is because of the geology of Florida. Uh, Florida is built on sand and limestone. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is you put one of those walls up to hold the water back, it will just perk up. Yes. Mm. Yeah, in Miami they're having it's flooding in areas away from coasts and away from rivers because of the percolation that's occurring. Yeah. So. Okay. So that means the solution is that much more expensive. <laughs> You're talking about really raising a road mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than putting up a wall, which would be a lot cheaper. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. All right. So this was a... Sorry. 
just a discussion item yeah, and, this is a new and topic something. For us. Yeah, and, new and, topic. You know, I was talking about the three to five year goals. Mm -hmm. uh, the thinking about, uh, I think we need to start thinking about sustainability and the TPO's role in sustainability with transportation. Uh, we're also going to become involved with the Indian River Lagoon program to find mm -hmm. out uh, clearly there's some interaction between the water quality and what we have for mm -hmm. drainage uh, treatment on our roadway projects. So, uh, right. and here we are talking about water again. So this is an area I think that the TPO uh, will, will find itself involved in. Uh, and I think it should be. So uh, I think we have some some important work to do here in understanding it. So uh, thank you for your attention on this subject. All right. Thank you. Now next is item 7B, the Malabar Road PD and E update. Uh, Georgiana Gillette. And or you. All right. No. No. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Your name, sir. I'm Vic Petit okay. with Atkins. Oh, okay. Uh, we're working with the Florida Department of Transportation. All right. And our project Welcome. manager from the department is Romina Kuchik, who's okay. here today. You probably yeah. know her from Oh, yes, we sure past. do. Well, nice to see so you. We, All right. We're here today to, to give you an update on, on the project, to talk about the information. It will come out in a different format. Okay. Uh, the purpose of our briefing really today is to talk about the project uh, we're at in the process and to also let you know about the upcoming public hearing and you should have received something in the mail about that mm -hmm. scheduled for February 28th uh, at the Palm, uh, Palm Bay, can you want to say, excuse me, Palm Bay for some reason, Palm Bay City Council Chambers. Uh, that will begin with a 5 p.m. open house meeting and then we'll have a formal hearing activity at 6 p.m. Okay. So the project is part of the overall transportation project, the PD&E. You've heard this before. It's part of the, one of the steps. The key elements of that project as shown here for, as a, from a PD&E perspective are public involvement, engineering analysis, environmental and socioeconomic analysis. Now the step we're at now is just before the, the far right hand side where it says public hearing. We're preparing, we're giving briefings to local agencies, TPO committees, et cetera, in advance of that. Now the project in general, uh, our project limits goes from Babcock Street to US-1. Uh, we'll be looking at widening to four lanes where that's warranted within the design uh, horizon, looking at proposing bicycle and pedestrian facilities throughout the corridor. It's approximately 3.64 miles in length, uh, currently classified as an uh, urban minor arterial. The other element that's important to note is that the proposed access management classification will be changed from three to five between I-95 and Weber Road. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on that in just a moment. Uh, this chart is really just to kind of give you a big picture of what we look at. It, it's, it's, the, it's the classic comparison matrix that we use in pg and &E studies. And the ba major areas are defining what the purpose and need are for the project impacts to the social environment, impacts to the culture environment, natural environment, the physical environment, and then of course the project costs that go into to, uh, various alternatives. We've defined a total of five different alternatives in total, and I'll be focusing on, uh, in addition to the no build, I'll be talking about what we call a recommended build alternative, which is alternative E. Uh, in addition to those traditional elements in this on this particular project of real concern and, and focus has been the environmentally endangered lands and Malabar scrub sanctuary properties, uh, coordination and potential impact of those. We've met with the uh, Broward County's EEL group. We've met with their selection and management committee. Uh, we've obtained their approval for the concepts you're about to see. Uh, only one thing they ask us to do, this, the department to do really, when it goes to engineering and final design is to report back again so they can see that the same concepts are moving forward when it gets to that stage. These properties, because of the way they were funded for purchase, have to be, uh, any encroachment or acquisition has to be approved at the state level. So the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the FDEP, uh, and then their acquisition and restoration council actually has to process that and approve it. That will be done during the design phase because <clears throat> the design phase is actually roughly four years out from today. Uh, the Malabar Disc Golf Park is also the same type of property, goes through the same process. 
So this recommended bill alternative uh, in, in sections here, section one shown uh, on the map uh, from Enterprise Avenue to Corey Road will be widened from two lanes to four lanes. And I'll give you a picture of what that looks like in just a moment. Two lanes in each direction. Uh, the next section, which is from Corey Road to Marie Street, will actually be a reconstructed uh, facility, two lanes, plus a shared use path. And then the third section from, from Marie Street to US 1 will be a, a three lane section. And I'll, I'll give you the, the concepts of that in a moment. Uh, it's just in, in details, one piece that uh, is from Babcock <laughs> over to Enterprise. Today, there's not a bike lane provided in the eastbound direction. So we'll be including that along with it to give continuity throughout this, this corridor. It's already four lanes with turn lanes and those kind of facilities. We'll be providing pedestrian and bicycle facilities throughout the corridor, which are not there today. Uh, access management change I mentioned a moment ago. And we'll have a raised median, as you'll see in the pictures. And of course, every transportation project includes adding capacity and highway improvements as potential ponds being developed for drainage from the roadway itself. Uh, so looking at what we call the typical sections for each of the corridor, each of the sections from Enterprise Avenue to Weber Road, it's, it's designated as a four-lane urban typical section. Uh, the posted speed here will be uh, 45 miles per hour. Uh, it'll have two travel lanes for vehicles in each direction, and they'll have curb and gutter, but it'll also include bike lanes in each direction and sidewalks on both sides. The alignment of that will basically start toward the north portion of the existing alignment, and then we'll turn slightly to the south as we move to the east, and then as we approach what is being uh, proposed now as a, a roundabout at Weber Road. Then the next section is from Weber Road to Corey Road. Here again, it's, it's four lanes, two travel lanes in each direction. It changes from an urban typical section to what they refer to as a suburban typical section. The biggest differences here are uh, the lane widths are 12 feet wide and not 11 feet wide. There's no curb and gutter on the outside. The drainage will be handled uh, through swells. There will be sidewalks on each side, and the paved shoulders are seven feet, which can accommodate bicycles as well. It's a wider footprint, if you will, uh, as far as right-of-way is required. Then after the roundabout Weber, the alignment will dip slightly to the south. And as we approach the Malabar Scrub Sanctuary property, we, we begin transitioning slightly to the north. We do encroach upon that property uh, a, a small amount. And uh, again, this has been chaired and briefed with the EEL staff and, and committee. And we move slightly north, taken right away from both sides until we re uh, approach another potential roundabout at Corey Road. Uh, the roundabouts. Uh, while the pictures, they look a little oblong, they're actually not. They're round. Uh, and they're just distorted by the, the shape of the, the slide here. Uh, so roundabouts there. The reason is anytime the, the department looks at adding capacity or making improvements to inter intersections, they consider roundabouts. And we go through a three-phase analysis of those. At this point, those intersections uh, appear that they would function well as roundabouts in the long term, and those will be considered as they look at uh, improvements over the time life of this project. The primary consideration here is safety compared to a traditional intersection. And it also, in, in this case, supports uh, the local goal, particularly the town of Malabar, their keen interest in, in speed control, reducing speeds uh, through the corridor. Uh, the next section will be that two-lane rural typical section, reconstructing uh, the existing roadway on a slightly different alignment. It will be one travel lane in each direction. It will have seven feet, seven feet wide paved shoulders. And on the north side of the alignment, there'll be a, a, a 10 foot wide shared use path. Uh, that alignment comes out of the, the roundabout at Corey and dips down to the south side of the existing alignment to avoid the post office uh, property there. Then as we near the real critical point in this entire project as far as alignments go from public lands perspective, we had to thread between the scrub sanctuary and the disc golf park. Uh, we do have impact to both of those, although we've been able to minimize that with this uh, typical section. 
And as I said earlier, this has met with approval. And then we move to the east of the disc golf park. We start moving south again, and we then hold the right-of-way line, the existing right-of-way line on the north side, so no more impacts to the scrub sanctuary. In total, we're looking at approximately 0.85 acres of impact to a Malabar scrub sanctuary out of roughly 580 acres. So I think they're happy that we've been able to minimize that with this, with this approach. Then the final section of this is uh, from Marie Street to US 1, uh, a three-lane section. This is basically what, what we refer to as downtown Malabar. More development, more driveways coming on to this, which is why we go with a, a center turn lane throughout that section. Bike lanes, again, in each direction, and uh, sidewalks on each side. Uh, this alignment is essentially down the center of, of the existing roadway, widening on both sides until we get close to the intersection at US-1, where we do flare out a little bit further on the north side. We're providing additional turn lanes there, eastbound to northbound, or uh, from Malabar Road to go north on US-1. We also have uh, two left turn lanes coming from US-1 uh, moving north to the west. So that'll improve that intersection as, as well. The access management plan I mentioned a moment ago, access classification will actually become uh, class five, currently is a three throughout the entire corridor with length, and we're going to a five. The major difference really is uh, both the three up to Corey Road, it, it will have a, a raised median, that's no different. The major difference is between Babcock and Weber Road, the spacing of the openings in that median would differ as far as the criteria goes. So a little stricter spacing on, on those openings. Uh, project costs, as you know, projects of this magnitude, uh, even at three, a little over three and a half miles are expensive. The right-of-way costs are shown here, design and construction inspection, and then construction costs all total up to just under $55 million. Uh, and I'll just point out those are subject to change as it moves forward through into design and those, those elements. And I'll come right back. I'm almost through. Just real quickly, the schedule on this. I mentioned it a moment ago. Public hearing will be on February 28th. Uh, we, we are planning for a state approval of the environmental impact report in June. Uh, design is now scheduled for fiscal year 2022. Railway uh, purchase and construction are neither funded at this point in time. Uh, no specific money available for, available for that. Uh, one reason is the, uh, the this time frame is so far out it wouldn't be in the pipeline yet to identify that. So that's why we're looking at uh, this. And it's really in large part driven by its priority within the, within the prioritization of, of the TPO's list. Uh, there are intersection improvements already being uh, developed and will be made at Corey and Weber and Malabar Road. Those intersection improvements will include adding turn lanes on, on uh, Malabar Road at those two intersections as an interim project. Uh, doesn't affect what we're talking about here. Our project is more long term. Those projects are acquiring right of way at, this, at the present time. It's been designed. They're acquiring right of way for that. And then we can be contacted. This is in your handout, both uh, Lorena's. Uh, contact information and my contact information are there. And our website uh, shown there has, we've, up, we've uploaded all the new reports, a total of 16 new reports and documents to go with this, as well as the pre briefing presentations that you see here and others. So I tried to not take okay. too much of your time to hit the highlights, but I'll, hmm. I'll uh, take your questions. All right. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question. Yeah, Ms. Mr. San Diego. I have a question with regards to the roundabouts. Uh, when I see roundabouts, I'm thinking about the roundabout like here mm -hmm. in Vieira. Um, and the last presentation we had concerning roundabouts, uh, I believe we understand that they should be a little bigger in order to um, to allow for, for uh, I guess, better traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, are they going to be about the same size we have here in Vieira, or are they going to be bigger? Or what, well, I don't, I don't know the idea? dimensions. We, the concepts we developed have been developed to handle semi-trucks, so uh, yes. probably would be, it's, it's a different kind of design than what you have here. Let me just start with that. It's going to be a different type of layout, and it's real more what we see as the, the traditional designs being used today. It's going to have a different design than what you have here. 
that will uh, accommodate uh, semi-tractor trailers as well as automobiles. So I think what you'll see is a, a better flow. And, and the way it's being designed will actually help reduce speeds into, as it enters and as they exit the facility. The, there, will, there is on our website a, a video on roundabout uh, design and use that's been prepared for the Department of Transportation, and it actually shows both a more urban setting and a more rural setting, where you do see semi-tractor trailers making U-turns, uh, for example, making a, a left turn to the roundabout. That's, that's what we're looking at. And you said this is, this is built more to an urban setting uh, or, or urban standard. It can be both. I mean, I think there's different sections, as you saw there, that we are classified as urban. Uh, the major difference, the major reason they're classified as urban is the, the lane width, travel lane width, and the use of an enclosed drainage system are probably the two biggest criteria. And it has lower, dis, lower uh, posted speed limits and design speeds. The roundabouts obviously will have lower speed operating speeds within those, and everything had to be done in advance to uh, help motors understand that they need to reduce speed. Uh, Mr. Holton. Yes, thank you. And uh, I know most of us out there have the internet, but not everyone. And so I, yes, I did see that uh, you do have the plans available at Franklin DeGroote Library as well. That's right next to City Hall. Yes, Is that sir. correct? Yes. Okay, and, that and the town of Malabar has a complete set. They're uh, at the library. They're at the reference desk. You can see them there uh, at the town town hall of Malabar. They're they're there probably in the council chamber. And and, and I just want to echo what uh, what Councilman Santiago was saying because um, I, I travel that almost every day. And because they're, you know, the distance between the causeways of Melbourne and Wabasso mm -hmm. and in New River County, Malabar Road is heavily, heavily traveled mm -hmm. by tractor trailers. Mm -hmm. One of the main things you see out there is tractor trailers. So the roundabouts absolutely have to be able to sustain tractor trailer use. And the other uh, compliment I want to make is about the addition of the, of the uh, bicycle lane because there's a really, really nice trailhead mm -hmm. uh, right behind the fire department on Malabar <clears throat> Road, which is on the north side across the street from the, uh, the Frisbee. Right, disc golf. golf. Disc golf, yeah. So there's a really, really nice trailhead there, and I think a lot of people would use it more if they could get to it. Parking there is not that great. You have to bring your bicycle mm -hmm. on your car and then get on the trail. So, um, so I just mm -hmm. want to compliment you on adding that. And the reason it's on the north side, well, two reasons it's on the north side. One reason the town of Malabar's preference <laughs> was for it to be on the north side of the roadway. And it, make, it, it makes sense to use the expression because it, it gives access from the crossing, trail crossing at Marie Street, all the way down to the park and into the scrub sanctuary, the trailhead. So. Yeah. If I, Mr. If I, um, Vic, I think it's worth repeating the comments you made about the timeline on this, or maybe I can summarize it. Uh, this is a PD&E study. This is the first step in the long, slow boat to China to get a road done. Uh, because of, and, and design is funded. If we're doing a PD&E study these days, you have to have the, sec the next step funded. So you have to have design in the work program. But it's like four years out, didn't you say? 2022, yes. 2022. So that length of time means the PD&E study is going to have to be somewhat redone. So there will be a chance to look at the traffic forecasts and this lane assignment, whether or not the two-lane section is still the appropriate way to go. Uh, look at the roundabout question. That's going to have to be looked at. So there will be a, a required look at this again in, in, in prior to the design beginning. And then there is no right of way or construction funded at this time. Now, that's not that unusual. Generally, the department likes to wait to get the design done so they have a much more specific sense of what the cost and the right of way impacts and all that will be. But there's a long way to go to get this project fully implemented and open to traffic. I think it's a good point. While the PDE may not have to be redone, there will be a fresh look at traffic forecasts. Right. It's called uh, a reevaluation. Reevaluation is what yeah. they refer to it as. And if there's a need to revisit some of the, the impacts and those kind of things, they'll have, they'll have to do that at that time. Yeah. Uh, we, one, one note I will say, and I'll go ahead and bring it up since I know it's, it's, it this has been for three years now a major concern on the project, is why are we not widening the entire corridor? So I'll go ahead and just bring it up, if I, if I may. And we did look at that starting two years ago, the middle of the Bob, 
and staff, and he came to, to DeLand, and we all met there with the Department of Transportation, and said, okay, let's look at the traffic. So what we did was actually, DOT asked their traffic consultant, which was not us in this case, to forecast five more years out into the future, and just to see. And while we looked at and saw growth, as you move from west to east toward US-1, there is a decline, uh, a steady decline in the traffic volumes. Some of that's due to proposed improvements between now and 2045, uh, which was the forecast year they, they started using at that, uh, which siphoned traffic off as it moved in different directions. So we did not, were not able to significantly justify uh, in a way that we could impact those public properties in particular, taking of that for a widening when we couldn't say definitively we have to widen the four lanes. So what we've tried to come up with is a compromise that gives us the best solution, the safest design concept, and also one, by the way, that the town of Malabar was happy to, uh, they gave us a resolution. They preferred a two or three lane section from Corey to US-1. Mm -hmm. So we did, we did work with them very closely. We met a number of times over the last year and a half with the council uh, to try to, to mm -hmm. meet the need. All right. Sounds very good. Thank you, Vic. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none. Thank you Thank very you. much. Item 7C, staff report. Mr. Calm. I have nothing to add. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> 7D is a public participation report. Abby Rex, but I know your name has been changed. We need yes. to change it in our it's a report. It's work in progress. The ladies yeah. in the room understand. <laughs> All uh, right. my name is I don't even know what to call her today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Abby Hemingway, and uh, I am the public involvement officer for the Space Coast TPO. And um, today I'm just going to briefly review uh, what we did as far as outreach and engagement for December, and also just take a look at our snapshot for 2017. Um, so if you look in your agenda package for December, we have um, we have uh, some of our meetings and our attendance. You can see that for our attendance, they were mainly our regularly scheduled uh, meetings, TPO and TACCAC. We also, uh, as far as community events, December tends to be a little quiet in government. I'm sure you all uh, realize that, but our um, bike and pedestrian safety coordinator, Kim Smith, was out working with local agencies to provide helmets for bike giveaway donations. She ended up uh, giving over 275 helmets away. So such um, events include handlebars for holidays. I know that some mm. um, holidays for handlebars, however that goes. <laughs> um, and then she also worked with uh, Murray Han, who is on our BPAC committee, and uh, she was able to provide some helmets for an event through Harris Corporation mm. that they were doing for a giveaway. So that's, December is normally a big month for us for engagement and those types of events. I do want to call out um, one of our meetings that the TPO had the um, opportunity to speak at was the Brevard County Police Chiefs meeting. Georgiana spoke to that audience um, um, it's a key opportunity for the TPO to get in front of that many law enforcement agency heads and to discuss the importance of not only what the TPO is and what we do, but also uh, some of our highlight areas of concern in this county and how law enforcement agencies can really act as a resource. So that was a great opportunity. I do just want to give a shout out um, to Melbourne Police Department. We are building our network of law enforcement agency contacts and the TPO has really um, tried to help any initiatives or operations or details that law enforcement want to do as far as an education campaign. So um, in September through December, Melbourne Police Department actually did a detail called Operation Street Smart, and it was a initiative that was focused on bicycle and pedestrian safety awareness. So they actually cited over 300 people, uh, mainly motorists, <laughs> who were violating uh, the law or, or violate, had any violations. Um, um, and they were educating as well, so out in the streets educating cyclists, pedestrians, as well as mm. motor motorists. So that was a great um, campaign. The TPO provided resources for that, such as brochures, and then um, I was able to help them out with graphics, as you can see here, for social media. If you flip to the back. 
for our social media for December, uh, as I said, it's kind of quiet normally that during that time, but one of our focus campaigns was called Don't Wreck the Holidays. You can see our sad snowman over here on the side. <laughs> uh, that campaign was actually a huge success. We ended up getting law enforcement to share it out on social media, and it kind of hit home with a few people. So we uh, saw a spike there in our reach that you can see up in the top left corner. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the 2017 Public Involvement Report. This is, so on your next page, the attachment B, this is a snapshot of our year. Um, you can find a lot of these measurements and statistics in Laura's recap of the strategic plan, specifically underneath the communicate um, area in the strategic plan. But I just wanted to kind of highlight these important areas that the TPO has been working on when it comes to public involvement and public engagement. I think it's, it's really important to recognize some of um, some of these areas and how we've developed. So as far as law enforcement, you know, I've kind of already said we've developed our relationships, but we've seen a huge reward in that. Not only have we been able to help them, but they've helped us. So that reciprocal relationship is really important to continue. And um, our social media growth, you know, I think in any um, agency or any area, it's a conversation that you cannot afford to not be a part of. So uh, we're going to continue to grow that and um, hopefully use some other tools as well um, in 2018. We had um, 78, that number is wrong, sorry, 78 news features. Uh, you know, it's you can't stress enough that you have to have positive relationships with the media. And so we're very um, lucky that we have uh, positive relationships with not only our local, but also our broadcast stations as well. And we highlighted some focus groups that we wanted to um, really try to do some targeted outreach, not only last year, but this year. So senior citizens is a, is a key demographic in this um, County, so we held our senior stroll number one <laughs> walk, which Mayor Meehan was a part of. We're actually in the midst of planning another senior stroll, and uh, we're really excited that Vieira Company has actually decided to partner with us on that. So we're very mm -hmm. excited about that. We're kind of nailing down a location. And then um, Partners in Education, which is a Brevard Schools uh, program, we are highly involved in that. We just attended a, an event yesterday, a speed networking, and we met with um, about 30 school coordinators, seeing how we can support their programs at the school level. Um, new deliverables, if you go over to your left, this is an area that I think is really important. Um, because without these deliverables, you're not you're not getting too much public information out there. It's in, as much as we get in, it's important to push out in whatever way that we can. So um, our newsletter is one of those one of the big ones. We put out you know little articles with extra links for more information or linking back to our Facebook or Twitter page. If you're not on there, see me afterwards, and I'll make sure you start getting it. And then we've also um, created some deliverables for the bike ped safety education program because it's one of the main programs that's that's seen out in the public. We do a lot of events, go to a lot of city events and do that. So we created a new video for that and we also created a um, brochure. And we hope to do that with other programs, uh, TPO related programs, trails, um, and maybe mm -hmm. even a what is the TPO campaign for the general public, um, making sure that they understand what we are what we do and how we work with the municipalities. And then um, the project achievements and complete streets, Laura already kind of reviewed. I think um, what we're really excited about as far as complete streets go, Hickory is now in the works and we are um, working with the city of Melbourne, the public information officer there, to make sure that we're proactively working on education pieces before the street is um, you know, implemented and making sure the general public uh, is aware of what a complete street is and why it's important. Health First is also going to work on that information sharing as well. Okay, good. I think that's all I have. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? Good job. Good job. Mm -hmm. I like that name, In Route. That, that's, that's cool. Um, seven. Okay, 7E, local government report, Mr. Palm. Well, I'd like to announce that uh, <coughs> Barnes Boulevard, the widening of Barnes Boulevard that we've been talking about for 25 years is, is near completion, oh. uh, doing final striping. Uh, I don't know if there's a ribbon cutting schedule. There is a ribbon cutting. I hadn't gotten an invite on it yet, but. <laughs> we'll make sure that happens. It, 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 it needs to. I haven't so. heard anything about it either. Yeah, well, so, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's nice to get a project completed or announce the completion of a project mm -hmm. that's been, uh, Rockledge has been engaged in the county, the Vieira company for, for a long, long time. So that's finally going to be done. 
All right. Sounds great. Model motor agencies. I'll I'll take. Do you have anything? It's uh, okay. All right. Seven F. Oh yes. I'm sorry. Either. I'm just rolling through here. Um, That's fine, Mr. Palm. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, so, Steve. Good evening again. Um, just wanted to go over some of the activities some of our modal partners have been involved in. Um, I attended the last Canaveral Port Authority meeting. Uh, they adopted their master plan, and we'll be inviting them to come present that to this board in the next couple months. Um, they also approved a contract to make improvements to their North Cargo Berth 8, which will support their increased space operations out there. Many of you have seen um, the SpaceX rockets going there. They're going to have uh, Blue Origin rockets coming in as well soon. Uh, so that's exciting. But it would also be a multi-use facility, so if it need, they need to use it for other operations, they'll have that option as well. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to that, uh, Commissioner Allender? Well, uh Yesterday, got a, a grant from the state for $8.4 mm -hmm. million dollars to, oh, uh, right. yeah. uh, towards a $12 million project that we're improving some roads inside the port. Yeah, Which, I did see that, yes. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Look, maybe next time we get some real money. <laughs> <laughs> and then moving on. Well, we were the only port that got, uh, yes. so far, that's received any money in that program. Mm -hmm. 225 grants were submitted and um, but we were the only port that received any money from it so far. Wow. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And their next meeting is on the February 28th. And uh, I was unable to attend the Orlando uh, Melbourne International Airport meeting because they both meet at the same time. Um, <laughs> we're very close. Uh, so Laura Carter from our office attended that. And the they approved a uh, property ownership change that is uh, very critical to the Ellis Interchange mm -hmm. construction. So that, thank you, that is yes. another example of a great partnership um, that everyone has together. And the Ellis Interchange will actually begin, begin construction this fall. So it was an yes. important step. And the control tower is complete, and they're just waiting on some components to be installed by the FAA. I was actually able to take a tour of it last night. I attended the Engage uh, Young Professionals of Brevard meeting and uh, got a little, little tour. It was very impressive, very nice facility. Um, I believe they'll be having a big ribbon cutting once it's open, so I encourage you to all attend that. It will be very ex if it's half as exciting as the groundbreaking was. I, I can only, yes, can only imagine. Right. So. Um, in Space Florida, I don't, or, I, do I even need to give an update I, to that? That's How right. incredible was that launch the other day? It was, <laughs> it was awesome. It was fantastic. Uh, Laura and I actually got to go out on the Canaveral Air Force Base. We were invited by uh, our TAC representative uh, from Space Florida to go out and, on the Air Force Base and watch it. It was fantastic. Gosh. Um, and their next meeting is in March, the Space Florida Force meeting. All right. And I would like to add something under this topic too. Uh, Georgiana and I recently had a meeting with two executives from uh, Brightline, from Passenger Rail. Uh, specifically, one of the pieces of information I wanted was something, because I've been asked a lot, well, now Brightline's up and running down in uh, uh, Palm Beach to Lauderdale, what, what's yeah. in store for further north? Uh, the answer is they don't know yet. There has been no information uh, developed that, that, uh, about their schedule. Uh, the answer that I was given, and it makes sense, is that they're working with the contractors who will be installing track and upgrading crossings. Uh, this is a big project. There's a lot of track to install, plus new track completely to construct from Cocoa West. So it depends very much, their schedule depends very much on their contractor's ability to mobilize, get all the supplies they need, get their manpower, et cetera. And they're still working that out. They do not have a sense, even they don't know, if they're going to start the south and work north or, or vice versa. And they still have to find finalize getting the service from Lauderdale to the Miami station. So uh, I just wanted to give you an update because we're asked that a lot, what's going on, and the answer is we don't really have any more information. Still a little bit early, but uh, clearly they're preparing to move on to phase two. All right, All right. thank you very much. Very interesting report, Mr. Calm.
All right, um, 7G Regional Coordination Report. Mr. Collins. Yes, I do want to just uh, note uh, that if you'd like, you are invited to attend a ribbon cutting for the new interchange being built along 528 that we've all looked at as we've been driving past it uh, on our way back and forth to Orlando and the airport. Uh, we have an invitation in here from the uh, Expressway Authority for uh, March 9th for the ribbon cutting. And another point I uh, wanted to make is if you look at that interchange as you drive by, you see there's some gaps in the interchange itself. Those are not for ramps or roadways. Those are for Brightline. That interchange is built to accommodate the passenger rail service going through it. Okay? So uh, uh, when you look at, think about that when you go through that interchange, you will see that there are bridge spans with no road underneath, and it's for the train. Mm. Uh, they plan that into it. Oh, wow. Yep. All right, 7-H, Florida Department of Transportation report. Well, well Jen is getting Jenna up. Taylor. I just learned today that uh, we will be having before the end of the year. Can I announce this, Georgiana? I, yes, I uh oh. We will be having, before the end of this calendar year, Road Ranger service in Brevard oh, on I-95. Wow. Okay? Okay. That is something that I personally have been yes, working on for several years. And uh, yes. for those of you who don't realize this, that weren't around a couple of years ago when this came up, if you're driving north on I-95 out of Indian River County and you're approaching Brevard County, there's a big sign on the right-hand side that says, in... Uh, uh, and, and, and emergency service. Well, and I, I looked at that one time. I said, why is it ending here? And nobody knows why that sign is there unless you're a geek in transportation. <laughs> well, it's right, at the, it's right at the Indian River County line, and that's the boundary between DOT District 4 and DOT District 5. All right? We're in District 5. Mm -hmm. So District 4 has Rose Ranger. Well, why doesn't District 5? I could never understand it. So we started, I started shaking the bush through you all and got some resolutions passed, and eventually the department's coming around to offering oh, it. And I don't know how far, I don't know any details, I don't know how often, uh, what the extent of coverage is going to be, but... Uh, they, just, they, they said that their intent is to come present to the TPO and let you know Thank what you. the coverage would be and all. We, we, oh, okay. we will have, have them handle. come in, yes. Well. Okay. You must have read my mind when we came back from West Palm Beach yes. uh, with that. And I go, when are we going to get that road range? Yeah, you it's saw really the sign, yes, I saw <laughs> It reminds me every time I come yeah. up from Palm Beach. Yeah, yeah. So. Instead of a ribbon cutting, we're hoping to have a ceremonial dropping of the sign. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's Take right. Sign that's a, yeah, yeah that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay, George. Uh, Jana, Jana I didn't mean Taylor. Taylor. You know, okay. I'm Jana Taylor, your FDOT liaison. Um, I just have a couple of things to report. There's been some staff changes within our department. We have a new district secretary. Um, his name is Mike Shannon. He comes to us from the Turnpike office, um, and he just started with us a couple of weeks ago. And we also have a new director of transportation development. Um, her name is Lorene Bobo. She came from our I-4 Ultimate office. She was oh, the project okay. manager there. So hopefully all right. they'll all be able to come and attend a meeting here within the next couple of months so you can all meet them, both of them. And then um, attached in your agenda package is the construction, the monthly construction report. And uh -huh. does anybody have any questions? Yeah, any questions on the construction reports? All right, seeing none. Okay. Thank you, you. Ms. Taylor. Okay, next is, well, before I adjourn, I wanted to make sure that we all um, welcome our new members. Uh, Deputy Mayor Jerry Blanco, coming from the city of Coco, And Council Member Steve Osmer from Satellite Beach. And then uh, Frank Forster, council member from the city of Rockledge. Welcome, and we hope to see you more. Um, Actually, deputy mayor. De I'm sorry, deputy mayor. Okay, very good. Um, any other comments or concerns? All right, just real Ms. quickly, Chair. Mr. Holton. Yes, uh, I just wanted to let um, bring everyone up to speed real quickly on the uh, the no texting bill that's going through the yes. legislature right now. Um, that's HB 33 and SB 90. Um, HB 33 
is passed three of the three committees. Okay. Um, so it's it's on second reading calendar, ready to go to the floor essentially. Whoa. Um, SB 90 is passed three of the four, but still has to go through appropriations. Um, SB 90 is co-sponsored by our Senator Mayfield for this area. Okay. So if if there's any help that maybe we could reach out to Senator Mayfield, <coughs> excuse me, and try to get you know it moving in the Senate, ultimately because it looks like it stopped in the appropriations. So mm. if there's any help that we can hopefully okay. try to provide to get that passed. That sounds great because I think it needs I know to be it's passed. Part of our priority, so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, Mr. Smith. Yeah, I just wanted to. I pointed out I had my briefing with. Mr. Tom today, and I asked him if he had any idea why Pineda Causeway doesn't have lighting. We have lights on both other causeways. We have none on, and it's extremely dark. Yes, it is. And he said, well, bring it up at the TPO meeting, and maybe we can get the ball rolling somehow with FDOT and okay. get somebody to look into it. She's writing. All right. <laughs> You're right. Okay, John, did you hear that? I got it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because it's extremely dark, and, and I know we put... It an is. extension on the railing a while back to encourage bicyclers and walkers, but nobody uses it, particularly after dark, because it is so dark. It's just extremely dark. All right. Is that a good idea? All right. Mr. Anything Trent, else? I'm, oh. I'm admiring Mr. Holton's can. But no more kicking the can dot com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Check it out. <laughs> If there's no other business, oh, other than the next meeting will be March the 8th um, from 3 to 5. So if there's no other business, I will adjourn the meeting at 5.01. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.